Tobias versus Avalos, GR number L114783. Facts. Petitioners assail the constitutionality of RA7675, an act converting the municipality of Mandaluyong into a highly urbanized city to be known as the city of Mandaluyong. Prior to the enactment of the assailed statute, the municipalities of Mandaluyong and San Juan belonged to only one legislative district. Honorable Ronaldo Zamora, the incumbent congressional representative of this legislative district, sponsored the bill which eventually became RA7675. President Ramos signed it into law. Pursuant to local government code 1991, a plebiscite was held. The people of Mandaluyong were asked whether they approved the conversion. The turnout of the plebiscite was only 14.41% of the voting population. Nevertheless, 18,621 voted yes, whereas 7,911 voted no. By virtue of these results, RA7675 was deemed ratified in effect. Petitioners' contention were that RA7675, specifically Article 8, Section 46 thereof, is unconstitutional. They allege that it contravenes the one subject, one bill rule. They also alleged that the subject law embraced two principal subjects, namely the conversion of Mandaluyong into a highly urbanized city, and two, the division of the Congressional District of San Juan, Mandaluyong, into two separate districts. Petitioners argue that the division has resulted in an increase in the composition of the House of Representatives beyond that provided in the Constitution. Furthermore, petitioners contended that said division was not made pursuant to any census showing that the subject municipalities have attained the minimum population requirements. Issue 1. Whether or not RA7675 is unconstitutional. Answer. No. The conversion of Mandaluyong into a highly urbanized city with a population of not less than 250,000 indubitably ordains compliance with the one city, one representative, as provided in Article 6, Section 5, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution. The creation of separate congressional district for Mandaluyong is not a subject separate and distinct from the subject of its conversion into a highly urbanized city, but is a natural and logical consequence of its conversion into a highly urbanized city. It should be given a practical rather than a technical construction. It should be sufficient compliance with such requirement if the title expresses the general subject and all provisions are germane to that general subject. It suffices if the title should serve the purpose of the constitutional demand that it inform the legislators. The person interested in the subject of the bill and the public of the nature, scope, and consequence of the proposed law and its operation. Issue number two, whether or not the number of members of the House of Representatives may increase. Yes, the Constitution clearly provides that the House of Representatives shall be composed of not more than 250 members, unless otherwise provided by law. The present composition of the Congress may be increased if Congress itself so mandates through a legislative enactment. Issue number three, whether or not the subject law has resulted in jury mandering. No, jury mandering is the practice of creating legislative districts to favor a particular candidate or party. It should be noted that Representative Samora, the, the order of the assailed law, is the incumbent representative of the former San Juan or Mandaluyong district, having consistently won in both localities. By dividing San Juan or Mandaluyong, Representative Samora's constituency has in fact been diminished, which development could hardly be considered as favorable to him. Petition dismissed. By Sandra Sema Sema versus Kamalek. Facts. On 28 August 2006, the Arms Legislature or ARMM Regional Assembly, exercising its power to create provinces under Section 19, Article 6 of RA 9054, enacted Muslim Mindanao Autonomy Act No. 201, MMA Act 201, creating the province of Sharif Kabunsuan, composed of the eight municipalities in the 1st District of Maguindanao. MMA Act 201 provides 
Later, three new municipalities were carved out of the original nine municipalities constituting Sharif Kabuns 1, bringing its total number of municipalities to 11. Thus, what was left of Maguindanao were the municipalities constituting its second legislative district. Cotabato City, although part of Maguindanao's first legislative district, is not part of the province of Maguindanao. On February 6, 2007, the Sangguniang Panglungsod of Cotabato City passed Resolution No. 3999, requesting the Comelec to clarify the status of Cotabato City in view of the conversion of the first district of Maguindanao into a regular province under MMA Act 2201. Resolution No. 070407, which adopted the recommendation of the Comelec Law Department under a memorandum dated February 27, 2007, provides in pertinent part. Considering the foregoing, the Commission resolved, as it hereby resolves, to adopt the recommendation of the Law Department that pending the enactment of the appropriate Law of Congress to maintain the status quo with Cotabato City as part of Sharif Kabuns 1 in the 1st Legislative District of Mindanao, um, Maguindanao. On May 10, 2007, the Comelec issued Resolution No. 7902, subject to these petitions, amending Resolution No. 070407 by renaming the legislative district in question as Sharif Kabuns 1 Province with Cotabato City, formerly 1st District of Magundanao with Cotabato City. Issue. The petition raised the following issues. In GR number 177597, A. Preliminarily, whether the writs of certiorari, prohibition, and mandamus are proper to test the constitutionality of Comelec Resolution 7902 and number 2, whether the proclamation of Respondent Dilangalen as representative of Sharif Kabuns 1 province with Carabato City mooted the petition in GR number 177597. B. On the merits, whether Section 19, Article 6 of RA 9054, delegating to the Armed Regional Assembly the power to create provinces, cities, municipalities, and barangays is constitutional, and 2. If in the affirmative, whether a province created by the Armed Regional Assembly under MMA Act 201 without need of a national law creating a legislative district for such province. In GR number 177597 and GR number 178628, whether Comelec Resolution number 7902 is valid for maintaining the status quo in the 1st Legislative District of Maguindanao as Sharif Kabunzuan Province with Carabada City. Despite the creation of the province of Sharif Kabunzuan out of such district, excluding Cotabato City, held, wherefore, we this declare Section 19, Article 6 of Republic Act No. 9054 unconstitutional, in so far as it grants to the Regional Assembly of the Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao the power to create provinces and cities. Thus, we declare void Muslim Mindanao Autonomy Act No. 201 creating the province of Sharif Kabunzuan. Consequently, we rule that Comelec Resolution 7902 is valid. Ratio. The creation of any of the four local government units, province, city, municipality, or barangay, must comply with three conditions. First, the creation of a local government unit must follow the criteria fixed in the local government code. Second, such creation must not conflict with any provision of the Constitution. Third, there must be a plebiscite in the political units affected. New legislative districts may be created only by law. Congress cannot validly delegate to arm National Regional Assembly the power to create legislative district. The creation of LGU is governed by Section 10, Article 10 of the Constitution. No province, city, municipality, barangay may be created, divided, merged, or altered except in accordance with the criteria and local government code. The creation of any local government units must comply with the three conditions. Creation of LGU must follow the criteria as fixed in local government code. Such creation must not conflict with any provisions of the Constitution. Number three, there must be a plebiscite. 
Note that in order to create a city, there must be at least a population of 250,000, and that a province, once created, should have at least one representative in House of Representatives. Further, in order to have a legislative district, there must be at least 250,000 population in said district. In the present case, Cotabato City did not meet the population requirement, so Sema's contention is untenable. On the other hand, ARM cannot validly create the province of Sharif Kabunswan without first creating a legislative district. However, such creation is not legally possible because creation of legislative district is solely vested in Congress. At most, what ARM can create are barangays, not cities and provinces. Therefore, Section 19, Article 6 of RA 9054 is unconstitutional. Facts Bagong Bayani and Akbayan Citizens Party filed before the Kamala Competition under Rule 65 of the Rules of Court, challenging Omnibus Resolution No. 3785, issued by the Comelec. This resolution approved the participation of 154 organizations and parties, including those impleted, in the 2001 partless election. Petitioners seek the disqualification of private respondents, arguing min mainly that the partless system was intended to benefit the marginalized and underrepresented, not the mainstream political parties, the non-marginalized or overrepresented. Presented. Issue. S whether or not political parties may participate in the partless elections, whether or not the partless system is exclusive to marginalized and underrepresented, underrepresented sectors and organization. Health. The petitions are partly meritorious. Cases should be remanded to the Comelec, which will determine other after summary evidentiary hearings whether the 154 parties and organizations enumerated in the assailed omnibus resolution satisfy the requirements of the Constitution in RA 7941. The resolution of this court directed the Comelec to refrain proclaiming any winner during the last party list election shall remain in force until after the Comelec have compiled and reported its compliance. A. Yes. Whether or not political parties may participate in the partless elections? Yes. Whether or not the partless system is exclusive to marginalized and underrepresented sectors and organization? No. Rationale. Rationale. Political parties, even the major ones, may participate in the partless elections. Under the Constitution in RA 7941, private respondents cannot be disqualified from the partless elections, merely on the ground that they are political parties. Section 5, Article 6 of the Constitution provides that members of the House of Representatives may be elected to a partless system of registered national, regional, and sectoral, sectoral parties or organizations. Furthermore, under Section 7 and 8, Article 9, Letter C of the Constitution, political parties may be registered under the partless system. For its part, Section 2 of RA 97941 also provides for a partless system of registered national, regional, and sectoral parties or organizations or coalitions thereof. Section 3 expressly states that a party is either a political party or a sectoral party, or a coalition of parties. Letter B, that political parties may participate in the partless elections does not mean, however, that any political party or any organization or group that, or for that matter, may do so. The requisite character of these parties or organizations must be consistent with the purpose of the partless system as laid down in the Constitution in RA 7941, Section 5, Article 6 of the Constitution. The provision on the partilist system is not self-executory. It is, in fact, in thirst first with phrase like, in accordance with law, or as may be provided by law. It was thus up to Congress to scope in game the lofty objective of the Constitution, hence, RA-7941 was enacted. Pieces, People vs. Halos Hoss Facts, the accused appellant, Romeo Halos Hoss, is a full-fledged member of Congress who is confined at the National Penitentiary while his conviction for statutory rape and acts of lasciviousness is pending appeal. 
The accused appellant filed a motion asking that he be allowed to fully discharge the duties of a congressman, including attendance at legislative sessions and committee meetings despite his having been convicted in the first instance of an unbailable offense on the basis of popular sovereignty and the need for his constituents to be represented. Issue whether or not accused appellant should be allowed to discharge mandate as member of House of Representatives held election is the expression of the sovereign power of the people. However, in spite of its importance, the privileges and rights arising from having been elected may be enlarged or restricted by law. The immunity from arrest or detention of senators and members of the House of Representatives arises from a provision of the Constitution. The privilege has always been granted in a restrictive sense. The provision granting an exemption as a special privilege cannot be extended beyond the ordinary meanings of its terms. It may not be extended by intendment, implication, or equitable consideration. The accused appellant has not given any reason why he should be exempted from the operations of Section 11, Article 6 of the Constitution. The members of Congress cannot compel absent members to attend session if the reason for the absence is a legitimate one. The confinement of a congressman charged with a crime punishable by imprisonment of more than six years is not merely authorized by law. It has constitutional foundations. To allow accused appellant to attend congressional sessions and committee meeting for five days or more in a week will virtually make him a free man, with all the privileges appurtenant to his position. Such an aberrant situation not only elevates accused appellant's status to that of a special class, it also would be a mockery of the purposes of the correction system. Turlianis versus Pimentel Facts, July 27, 2003 a group of more than 300 heavily armed soldiers, led by junior officer of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, AFP, stormed into the Oakwood Premier Apartments in Makati City and publicly demanded the resignation of the president and key national officials. On the same day, President Gloria Macapagal Oroya is issued Proclamation No. 427 and General Order No. 4, declaring the state of rebellion and calling out the armed forces to suppress the rebellion. Petitioner Antonio F. Gerulianis IV was charged, along with his comrades, with coup d'etat defined under Article 134A of the Revised Penal Code before the RTC of Makati. Four years later, Petitioner, who was remained in detention, who has remained in detention, threw his hat in the political arena and won a seat in the Senate with a six-year term commencing at noon on June 30, 2007. Petitioner filed with the RTC Makati City Branch 148 an omnibus motion for leave of court to be allowed to attend Senate sessions and relate related requests. The trial court denied all the requests in the omnibus motion. Issue, whether or not membership in Congress exempt and accused from statutes and rules which apply to validly incarcerated persons in general. Held. No, it is impractical to draw a line between convicted prisoner and pretrial detainees for the purpose of maintaining jail security. And while pretrial detainees do not forfeit their constitutional rights upon confinement, the fact of their detention makes their right more limited than those of the public. When a person indi indicted for an offense is arrested, he is deemed placed under the custody of the law. He is placed in actual restraint of liberty in jail so that he may be bound to answer for the commission of an offense. He must be detained in jail during the pendency of the case against him, unless he is authorized by the court to be released on bail or on recognizance. Presumption of innocence does not carry with the full enjoyment of civil and political rights. Allowing accused appellant to attend congressional sessions and committee meetings for five days or more in a week will virtually make him a free man with all the privileges appurtenant to his position. Such an aberrant situation not only elevates accused appellant's status to that of a special class, it also would be a mockery of the purposes of the correction system. Adaza v. Bacana Facts Homo Bono A. Adaza was elected governor of the province of Misabis Oriental. He took his oath of office and started discharging his duties as provincial governor on March 3, 1980. Elected vice governor for said province was respondent Fernando Bacana Jr., who likewise qualified for the and assumed said office on March 3, 1980. Under the law, 
the respective terms of office would expire on March 3, 1986. March 27, 1984, Respondent Bacana filed his Certificate of Candidacy for the May 14, 1984, Batasang Pambansa election. Petitioner Adasa followed suit on April 27, 1984. In the ensuing election, Petitioner won by placing first among the candidates while Respondent lost. July 19, 1984, Petitioner took his oath of office as Mambabatas Pambansa and since then he has discharged the function of said office. July 23, 1984, Respondent took his oath of office as Governor of Misamis Oriental before President Ferdinand Marcos and started to perform the duties of Governor on July 25, 1984. Claiming to be the lawful occupant of the Governor's office, Petitioner has brought this petition to exclude Respondent therefrom. He argues that he was elected to said office for a term of six years, that he remains to be the Governor of the province until his term expires on March 3, 1986, as provided by law, and that within the context of the parliamentary system. Petitioner further contends that Respondent Pakana should be considered to have abandoned or resigned from the position of Vice Governor when he filed his Certificate of Candidacy for the 1984 Batas Pambansa election, and since Respondent had reverted to the status of a mere private citizen after he lost in the Batas Pambansa election, he could no longer continue to serve as Vice Governor, much less assume the office of Governor. Issue whether or not a provincial governor who was elected and had qualified as Mambabatas Pambansa can exercise and discharge the function of both offices simultaneously. Whether or not a vice governor who ran for the position of Mambabatas Pambansa but lost can continue serving as vice governor and subsequently succeeded to the office of governor if the said office is vacated. Held, no. A provincial governor who was elected and had qualified as a Mambabatas Pambansa, cannot exercise and discharge the functions of both offices simultaneously. The constitutional prohibition against a member of the Batasan Pambansa from holding any other office or employment in the government during his tenure is clear and ambiguous. Unambiguous. Section 10, Article 8 of the 1973 Constitution provides as follows. Section 10. A member of the National Assembly Batas Pampansa shall not hold any other office or employment in the government or any subdivision, agency or instrumentality thereof, including government-owned or controlled corporations during his tenure, except that of prime minister or member of the cabinet. The language used in the above-cited section is plain, certain, and free from ambiguity. The only exemptions mentioned therein are the office of prime minister and cabinet member, the wisdom or expediency of the said provision is a matter which is not within the province of the court to determine. Answer to the other issues. Yes, a vice governor who ran for the position of Mambabatas Pambansa but lost can continue serving as vice governor and subsequently succeeded, succeed to the office of governor if the said office is vacated. The law governing the election of members of the Batas Pambansa on May 14, 1984, Section 13, of which specifically provides that governors, mayors, members of the various sangun sangunyang or barangay officials shall, upon filing a certificate of candid candidacy, be considered on fourth leave of absence from office. Indubitably, respondent falls within the coverage of this provision. Considering that at the time he filed his certificate of candidacy for the 1984 Batasan Pambansa election, he was a member of the Sangguinuang Panlalawigan. Jimenez v. Kabangbang Facts This is an ordinary civil action originally instituted in the court of first instance of Rizal for the recovery by plaintiff Nicanor T. Jimenez, Carlos Albert, and Jose Lucban of several sums of money by way of damages for the republication of an allegedly Libelious letter of defendant Bartolome Cabangbang. According to the complaint herein, it was an open letter to the President of the Philippines dated November 14, 1958, when Congress presumably was in session. The defendant caused said letter to be published in several newspapers of general circulation in the Philippines on or about said date. It is obvious that he was not performing his official duty 
either as a member of Congress or as an office or any committee thereof. Hence, said communication is not absolutely privileged. Upon being summoned, the latter moved to dismiss the complaint upon the ground that the letter in question is not libelous and that even if were, said letter is a privileged communication. This motion, having been granted by the lower court, plaintiff interposed the present appeal from the corresponding order of dismissal. Issue, whether or not the publication in question is a privileged communication. Held, no, the publication in question is not a privileged communication. The determination of the issue depends on whether or not the aforementioned publication falls within the purview of the phrase speech or debate therein, that is to say, in Congress used in this provision. Said expressions first to utterances made by congressmen in the performance of their official functions, such as speeches delivered, statements made, or votes cast in the halls of Congress, while the same is in session, as well as bills introduced in Congress, whether the same is in session or not, and other acts performed by congressmen, e either in Congress or outside the premises housing its office, in the official discharge of their duties as members of Congress or of Congressional Committee duly authorized to perform its function as such at the time of the performance of the acts in question. The publication involved in this case does not belong to this category. According to the complaint, Herein, it was an open letter to the President of the Philippines dated November 14, 1958, when Congress presumably was not in session, and defendant caused said letter to be published in several newspapers for general circulation in the Philippines on or about said date. It is obvious that in thus, in thus causing the communication to be so published, he was not performing his official duty, either as a member of Congress or as an officer or any committee thereof, hence contrary to the finding made by his honor. The trial judge said communication is not absolutely privileged. It was just repeated. It was not held libelous because the letter clearly implies that the plaintiff were not the planners, but merely tools, much less unwittingly on their part. The order appealed is confirmed. Laxon versus the Executive Secretary, GR number 128096. Facts. Eleven persons believed to be members of the Kurotong Baleleng Gang, which had been involved in a spate of bank robberies in Metro Manila, were slain along Commonwealth Avenue in Quezon City by elements of the Anti-Bank Robbery and Intelligence Task Group, ABRITG. SPO Edward, Eduardo de los Reyes exposed that what actually transpired was a summary execution or a rub-out and not a shootout between the Kurotong Baleleng Gang members and the are a brit tg the ombudsman formed a panel of and this panel letter absolved from any criminal liability all the pnp officers and personnel allegedly involved in the incident with a finding that the said incident was a legitimate police operation however a review board modified the bank of floor panels finding and recommended the indictment for multiple murder against 26 respondents including herein petitioner and interveners this recommendation was approved by the Ombudsman, except for the withdrawal of the charge against Chief Superintendent Ricardo de Leon. Petitioner questions the constitutionality of Section 4 of RA 8249, including Section 7, which provides that the said law shall apply to all cases pending in any court over which trial has not begun or has the approval thereof. Issue whether or not Section 4 and 7 of RA 8249 violate the petitioner's right to due process and the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. Ruling, it is unestablished precept in constitutional law that the guarantee of the equal protection of law violated by a legislation based on reasonable classification. The classification is reasonable and not arbitrary when there is concurrence of four elements, namely, one, it must rest on substantial distinction two it must be germane to the purpose of the law three must not be limited to existing conditions only and four must apply equally to all members of the same class all of which are present in this case the challengers of section 4 and 7 of RA 8249 failed to rebut the presumption of constitutionality and reasonableness of the question provision Farinius versus the Executive Secretary. Facts. A petition was filed seeking the court to declare unconstitutional Section 14 of RA 9006 
or the act to enhance the holding of free, orderly, honest, peaceful, and credible elections through fair election practices. As it repealed Section 67 of the Omnibus Election Code, mandating the ipso jure resignation from public office of one who filed his certificate of candidacy, except for president and vice president. It is the petitioner's contention that the repeal of Section 67 is a writer on the said law, the same embracing more than one subject, inconsistent to what the Constitution mandates. Further, it violated the Equal Protection Clause since the said law didn't repeal provision relating to appointive officials. Appointive officials would still be considered ipso jure resigned upon filing of their respective certificates of candidacy. Where's the issue? Held. Section 14 is not a writer. The purported dissimilarity of Section 67 of the Omnibus Election Code, which imposes a limitation on elective officials who run for an office other than the one they are holding, to the other provisions of the contested law, which deal with the lifting of the ban on the use of media for election propaganda, doesn't violate the one subject, one title rule. The court has held that an act having a single general subject indicated in its title may contain any number of provisions, no matter how diverse they may be, so long as they are not inconsistent with or foreign to the general subject, and they may be considered in furtherance of such subject by providing for the method and means of carrying out the general subject. The repeal of Section 67 is not violative of the Equal Protection Clause. Equal protection is not absolute, especially if the classification is reasonable. There is reasonable classification between an elective official and an appointive one. The former occupy their office by virtue of the mandate of the electorate. They are elected to an office for a definite term and may be removed therefrom only upon stringent conditions. On the other hand, appointive officials hold their office by virtue of their designation thereto by an appointing authority. Some appointive officials hold their office in a permanent capacity and are entitled to security of tenure, while others serve at the pleasure of the appointing authority. Another substantial distinction is that by law, appointed officials are prohibited from engaging in partisan political activity or take part in any election except to vote. Astorga versus Antonio Villegas. Facts. House Bill Number 9266, defining the powers, rights, and duties of the Vice Mayor of Manila, became a law under RA 4065 after both houses and the President signed it. However, it was later on found out that the said law was not the same as the version approved by the Senate as it was going through its revision. With this finding, the Senate President and the President himself sent out a statement saying they are withdrawing their signatures from the House Bill number 9266. Therefore, it should not be considered as a law. Issue. Whether or not the petition for mandamus injunction and or prohibition with preliminary mandatory and prohibitory injunction be granted and compel the respondents to comply with the provisions of RA 4065. Ruling. The Supreme Court recognized the withdrawal of the President and the Senate President's signatures from RA 4065 or House Bill 9266. Therefore, it did not become a law. The temporary restraining order was also made permanent. The intent of the lawmaking body, based on its journals, prevailed over technicality of the legal processes of enacting a bill. Array versus the Venetia. Facts. Challenging the validity of Republic Act No. 8240, charging violation of the rules of the House which petitioners claim are constitutionally mandated so that their violation is tantamount to a violation of the Constitution. The Bicameral Conference Committee submitted its report to the House at 8 a.m. on November 21, 1996, at 11.48 a.m. after a recess. Representative Ezekiel Javier, Chairman of the Committee on Ways and Means, proceeded to deliver his sponsorship speech, after which he was interpolated, period. He was interrupted when Representative Arroyo moved to, ad moved to adjourn for lack of quorum. In the course of his interpolation, Representative Joker Arroyo announced that he was going to raise a question on the quorum, although until the end of his interpolation, he never did. On the same day, the bill was signed by the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the President of the Senate and certified by the respective secretaries of both houses 
of Congress as having been finally passed by the House of Representatives and by the Senate on November 21, 1996. The enrolled bill was signed into law by President Fidel V. Ramos on November 22, 1996. Petitioner's principal argument is that RA number 8240 is null and void because it was passed in violation of the rules of the House, that these rules embody the constitutional mandate in Article 6, Section 16, Number 3, that each House may determine the rules of its proceedings, and that, consequently, violation of the House rules is a violation of the Constitution itself. They contend that the certification of Speaker de Venetia that the law was properly passed is false and spurious. Petitioners also charge that the session has, was hastily adjourned at 3.40 p.m. on November 21, 1996, and the bill certified by Speaker Jose de Venetia to prevent Petitioner Representative Arroyo from formally challenging the existence of a quorum and asking for a reconsideration. In a supplemental comment, Respondent de Venetia denies that his certification of H number 718 is false and spurious and contends that under the journal entry rule, the, the judicial inquiry sought to be petitioned by the petitioners is barred. This journal was approved on December 2, 1996 over the loan objection of Petitioner Representative Lagman. Adjournment of session on motion of Mr. Albano, there being no objection, the chair declared the session adjourned until, until 4 o'clock in the afternoon of Wednesday, November 27, 1996. It was 3.40 p.m. Thursday, November 21, 1996. This journal was approved on December 2, 1996. Again, no one objected to its approval except Representative Lagman. Issue. Rules are hardly permanent in character. The prevailing view is that they are subject to revocation, modification, or waiver at the pleasure of the body adopting them, as they are primarily procedural. Courts, ordinary, have no concern with their observance. They may be waived or disregarded by the legislative body. Consequently, mere failure to conform to them does not have the effect of nullifying the act taken if the requisite number of members have agreed to a particular measure. The above principle is subject, however, to this qualification, where the construction to be given to a rule affects person other than members of the legislative body, the question presented is necessarily judicial in character. Even its validity is open to question in a case where private rights are involved. In this case, no rights of private individuals are involved, but only those of a member who, instead of seeking redress in the House, choose to transfer the dispute to this court. We have no more power to look into the internal proceedings of a House than members that of that House have to look over our shoulders, as long as no violation of constitutional provision is shown. Avel Jose Avelino Petitioner versus Mariano Cuenco Facts. In a session of the Senate, Taniada's request to deliver a speech in order to formulate charges against then-Senate President Avellino was approved. With the leadership of the Senate President followed by his supporters, they deliberately tied to delay, tried to delay and prevent Taniada from delivering his speech. Before Senator Taniada could deliver his privileged speech to formulate charges against the incumbent Senate President, the petitioner Motu Propio adjourned the session of the Senate and walked out with his followers. Senator Kabili requests to make the following incidents into a record. Number one, the deliberate abandonment of the chair by the petitioner made it incumbent upon Senate President Pro Tempore Arans and the remaining members of the Senate to continue the session in order not to paralyze the functions of the Senate. Senate President Pro Tempore Arans suggested that respondent be designated to preside over the session with suggestion was carried which suggestion was carried anonymously. The respondent, Senator Mariano Cuenco, thereupon took the chair. Number three, Gregorio Abad was appointed acting secretary upon motion of, this, of Senator Aranz because the assistant secretary, who was then acting as secretary, had followed the petitioner when the latter abandoned the session. Senator Taniada, after being recognized by the chair, 
was then finally able to deliver his privileged speech. Thereafter, Senator Sanidad read aloud the complete text of said resolution number 68 and submitted it, submitted his motion for approval thereof, and the same was unanimously approved. The petitioner, Senator Jose Avellino, in a co to proceeding, asked the court to declare him the rightful Senate president and asked the respondent, Mariano Cuenco, consenting that the latter had not been validly elected because 12 members did not constitute a quorum. The majority required of the 24-member Senate. Issues. Whether or not the court has jurisdiction on subject matter. Whether or not Resolution 67 and 68 was validly approved. Whether or not the petitioner be granted to declare him the rightful president of the Philippine Senate and House Respondent. Rulings. In the resolution of the case, the court held that Number one, the Supreme Court held that they cannot take cognizance of the case. The court will be against the doctrine of separation of powers. In view of the separation of powers, the political nature of the controversy and the constitutional grant to the Senate of the power to elect its own president, which power should not be interfered with nor taken over by the judiciary. The court will not interfere in this case because the selection of the presiding officer affect only the senators themselves who are at liberty at any time to choose their officers, change or reinstate them. If as the, if as the petition must imply to be acceptable, the majority of the senators want petitioner to preside, his remedy lies in the Senate session hall, not in the Supreme Court. It was validly constituted, supposing that the court has jurisdiction. Justice Paras, Feria, Pablo, and Beng Son say there was the majority required by the Constitution for the transaction of the business of the Senate because, firstly, the minutes say so. Secondly, because at the beginning of such session, there were at least 14 senators, including Senators Pendatun and Lopez. And thirdly, because in view of the absence from the country of Senator Tomas Confessor, 12 senators constitute a majority of the Senate of 12 of 23 senators. When the Constitution declares that a majority of each House shall constitute a quorum, the House does not mean all the members. Even a majority of all the members constitute the House. There is a difference between a majority of the House, the latter requiring less number than the first, therefore an absolute majority, 12, all of, of all the members of the Senate less one constitute constitutional majority of the Senate for the purposes for the purpose of a courtroom. The court adopts a handoff policy on this matter. The court found it in judicious to declare the petitioner as the rightful president of the Senate, since the office depends exclusively upon the will of the majority of the senators. The rule of the Senate about tenure of the president of that body being amenable at any time by the majority. At any session thereafter held with 13 or more senators in order to avoid all controversy arising from the divergence of opinion here about quorum and for the benefit of all concerned, the said 12 senators who approved the resolutions herein involved could ratify all their acts and thereby place them beyond the shadow of a doubt. Hence, by a vote of 6 to 4, the Supreme Court dismissed the petition on the ground as it involved a political question. The Supreme Court should abstain in this case because the selection of the presiding officer affects only the senators themselves who are at liberty at any time to choose their officers, change or reinstate them. Bengtson versus Blue Ribbon Committee On facts, on July 30, 1987, the Republic of the Philippines represented by the Presidential Commission on Good Governance, PC, GG, filed a complaint with Sandikam Bayan against the petitioner of this case. PCGG alleged, among others, that defendants, petitioner therein Benjamin Coque Romualdez and Jul Juliette Gomez Romualdez, alleged cronies of former President Marcus and First Lady Emelda Romualdos Marcus, engaged in schemes and stratagems to, in to unjustly enrich themselves at the expense of the Filipino people. Among these stratagems are Number one, obtain control of some big business enterprises such as Meralco, Filipina Shell, and PCI Bank. Number two, manipulate the formation of Erectors Holding Inc. to appear viable and borrow more capital, reaching a total of more than two billion 
Number three, collaborated with lawyers, petitioners therein, of the Bengson Law Office, says in concealing funds and properties, in maneuvering the purported sales of interest in certain corporations, in misusing the Morocco pension fund worth $25 million, and in cleverly hiding behind the veil of corporate entity. On September 13, 1988, Senator Juan Ponce Enrile delivered a speech before the Senate on the alleged takeover of Sol Oil, incorporated by Ricardo Lopa, who died during the pendency of this case, and called upon the Senate to look into possible violation of the anti graft and Corruption Practices Act of RA 1319. The Senate Committee on Accountability of Public Officers, or Blue Ribbon Committee, SBRC, started its investigation through a hearing on 23rd of May, 1989, but Lopa and Bengson declined to testify. The SBRC rejected Petitioner Bengson's plea and voted to pursue its investigation. Petitioner claims that the SBRC in requiring the attendance and testimony acted in excess of its jurisdiction and legislative purpose. Hence, this petition issues whether or not the court has jurisdiction over this case, whether or not SBRC's inquiry has a valid legislative purpose, whether or not the sale or disposition of the Romualdez Corporation is a purely private transaction which is beyond the power of the SBRC to inquire into, whether or not the inquiry violates the petitioner's right to due process held. Number 1. Yes, as the court held in Angar versus Electoral Commission, the Constitution provided for an elaborate system of checks and balances to secure coordination in the working of the departments of the government, and it is the judiciary that was vested of the powers to determine the scope, nature, and extent of such powers, so the court has jurisdiction over this case. Whether or not the SBRC's inquiry has a valid legislative purpose? No. The speech of Senator Enrile contained no suggestion on contemplated legislation. He merely called upon the Senate to look into a possible violation of Section 5 of RA 1319. The purpose of the inquiry, to be conducted by Respondent SBRC, was to find out whether or not the relatives of President Aquino, particularly Ricardo Lopa, had violated the law in connection with the alleged sale of the 3639 Corporation of Cocoy Romualdez to the Lopa Group. There appears, therefore, no intended legislation involved. The inquiry also is not conducted pursuant to Senate Resolution No. 2123. As the committee alleged, the inquiry under SR 2123 is to look into the charges against PCGG filed by stockholders of Oriental Petroleum in connection with the implementation of Section 26, Article 18 of the Constitution. Whether or not the sale or disposition of the Romualdos Corporation is a purely private transaction, which is beyond the power of the SBRC to inquire into, answer is yes. Mr. Lopa and the petitioners are not connected with the government and did their acts as private citizens. Hence, such a case of alleged graft and corruption is within the jurisdiction, not of the SBRC, but of the courts. Sandigambayan allegedly took jurisdiction of this issue before the SBRC did. The inquiry of the Respondent Committee into the same justiciable controversy already before the Sangdigan Bayan would be an encroachment of the exclusive domain of judicial jurisdiction. Whether or not the inquiry violates the petitioner's right to due process, number four, that is no, the Constitution provides the right of an accused of crime to remain silent. This extends also to respondents in administrative investigation, but only if they partake of the nature of a criminal proceeding. This is not so in this case, but since the court already held that the inquiry is not in aid of legislation, the petitioner's therein cannot be compelled to testify. Standard Chartered Bank versus Senate Committee on Banks, Financial Institutions and Currencies, GR 167173. Facts. Senator Enrile delivered a privileged speech denouncing SCB Philippines for selling unregistered foreign securities in violation of the Securities Regulation Code, RA 8799, and urging the Senate to immediately conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation to prevent the occurrence of a similar fraudulent activity in the future. Upon motion of Senator Pangilinan, the speech was referred to respondent, which 
through its chairperson, Senator Angara, set an initial hearing and invited petitioners herein to attend the hearing. Petitioners by a letter stressed that there were pending cases in court allegedly involving the same issues, subject of the legislative inquiry, thereby posing a challenge to the jurisdiction of Respondent Committee to proceed with the inquiry. Legislative investigation commenced, but with the invited resource persons not being all present, Senator and Willie moved for the issuance of Supuena and an HDO or to include such absentees to the Bureau of Immigration's watch list. During the hearing, it was apparent that petitioners lacked proper authorizations to make disclosures and lack, lack the copies of the accusing documents being mentioned by Senator Enrile. Thus, when hearing adjourned, petitioners were later served with subpoenas by respondent. Petitioner now seeks that respondent committee be enjoined from proceeding, citing Bengson Jr. v. Senate Blue Ribbon Committee, claiming that since the issue is already preempted by the courts, the legislative investigation is an encroachment upon the judicial powers vested solely in the courts. Issue, whether the investigation in aid of legislation by respondent committee encroaches upon the judicial power of the courts. Ruling, no. The unmistakable objective of the investigation as set forth in the said resolution exposes the error in petitioner's allegation that the inquiry, as initiated in a private privilege speech by the very same Senator and really was simple, simply to denounce the illegal practice committed by a foreign bank in selling unregistered foreign securities. This fallacy is made more glaring when we consider that, at the conclusion of his privilege speech, Senator Enrile urged the Senate to immediately conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation so as to prevent the occurrence of a similar fraudulent activity in the future. Indeed, the mere filing of a criminal or an administrative complaint before a court or a quasi-judicial body should not automatically bar the conduct of a legislative investigation. Otherwise, it would be extremely easy to sub any intended inquiry by Congress through the convenient ploy of instituting a criminal or an administrative complaint. Surely, the exercise of sovereign legislative authority, of which the power of legislative inquiry is an essential component, cannot be made subordinate to a criminal or an administrative investigation. Neither can the petitioners claim that they were singled out by the respondent committee. The courts note that among those invited as resource person were officials of the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. These officials were subjected to the same critical scrutiny by the respondent relative to their separate findings on the illegal sale of unregistered foreign securities by SCB Philippines. It is obvious that the objective of the investigation was the quest for remedies in terms of legislation to prevent the recurrence of the alleged fraudulent activity. Wherefore, the petition for prohibition is denied for lack of merit. Arnold v. Balthazar, GR number 6749. Facts. The controversy arose out of the government's purchase of two estates, the Buenavista and Tambobong estates. Petitioner was the attorney, in fact, of Ernest Burnt in the negotiations for the purchases, which was affected. The price paid for both estates was $5 million. Thereafter, the Senate adopted Resolution Number 8, creating a special committee to determine the validity of the purchase and whether the price paid was fair and just. During the said Senate investigation, petitioner was asked to whom a part of the purchase price, or 440000 was delivered. Petitioner refused to answer this question. Hence, the committee cited him in contempt for con Tomasio's acts and ordered his commitment to the custody of the sergeant at arms of the Philippines Senate and imprisoned in the new believed prison. He reveals to the Senate or to the special committee the name of the person who received the 440000 and to answer questions pertinent thereto. Petitioner filed a habeas corpus proceeding. CFI ruled that the continued detention and confinement of petitioner pursuant to Senate Resolution Number 114 is illegal and that the Senate committed a clean abuse of discretion in not considering his answer naming one Jess D. Santos, the person to whom delivery of the sum of 440000 was made. Further, on the ground that the, pet the petitioner, by his answer, has purged himself of contempt and is consequently entitled to be released and discharged. Issue. Whether or not the Senate has a power to punish the petitioner for contempt. Yes, the Congress or any of its bodies has the power to punish 
recalcitrant witnesses. This is implied or incidental or necessary to the exercise of legislative power. The 1987 Constitution adopted the principle of the separation of powers, making each branch supreme within the realm of its respective authority. It must have intended each department's authority to be full and complete, independent of the other's authority and power. Provided that contempt is related to the exercise of the legislative power and is committed in the course of the legislative process, the legislature's authority to deal with a defined and contumacious witness should be supreme. And unless there is a manifest and absolute disregard of discretion in a mere exertion of arbitrary power coming within the reach of constitutional limitations, the exercise of the authority is not subject to judicial interference. The process by which a contumacious witness is dealt with by the legislature in order to enable it to exercise its legislative power or authority must be distinguished from the judicial process wherein offenders are brought to the courts of justice for punishment that criminal law imposes upon them. The former falls exclusively within the legislative authority, the latter within the domain of the courts, because the former is a necessary concomitant of the legislative power or process, while the latter has to do with the enforcement and application of the criminal law. Issue number two, whether or not petitioner has already purged himself of contempt. No, it is true that he gave a name, Jesti Santos, as the person to whom delivery of the sum of 440000 was made. However, the Senate committee refused to believe that this is the real name of the person whose identity is being the subject of the inquiry. The Senate therefore held that the act of the petitioner continued the original contempt or reiterated it. Finally, it is improper for the courts to declare that the continued confinement is an abuse of the legislative power and thereby interfere in the exercise of the legislative discretion. Kingona versus Caragu. Facts. Petitioner senators question the constitutionality of the automatic appropriation for debt service in the 1990 budget, which was authorized by PD81. Petitioners seek that PD81, PD1177, Section 31, and PD1967 be declared unconstitutional and restrain the disbursement of debt service under the 1990 budget pursuant to said decrees, while respondents contend that the petition involves a political question, repeal amendment of said laws. Issue, whether or not subject laws has been impliedly repealed by the 1987 Constitution. Answer, no. Well known is the rule that repeal or amendment by implication is formed up upon. Equally fundamental is the principle that construction of the Constitution and law is generally applied prospectively and not retrospectively, unless it is so clearly stated. The court finds that in this case the constituent laws are complete in all their essential terms and conditions and sufficient standards are indicated therein. The legislative intention in R.A. 4860 as amended Section 31 of PD number 1177 and PD number 1967 is that the amount needed should be automatically set aside in order to enable the Republic of the Philippines to pay the principal, interest, taxes, and other normal banking charges on the loans, credits, or, or indebtedness incurred as guaranteed by it when they shall become due without the need to enact a separate law appropriating funds, therefore, as the need arises. The purpose of these laws is to enable the government to make prompt payment and or advances for all loans to protect and maintain the credit standing of the country.